right, so here we are now with the second section of Living Buddhism, a section entitled Attachment. And we start with the chapter Letting Go, where the concept of Jayen was this key concept for the first section of the book. Tam Jai is sort of the, the key concept for the second part of the book appearing early in chapter three. So to break it down, so just as Jai Yen is, is a compound of Jai heart and Yen cold, uh, Tam Jai is a compound as well. Tam meaning make or do and Jai meaning heart. Uh, so Tam Jai as a uh, if you were to directly translate each of the words, you would get make heart. Um, there are no articles in, in Thai, so it would be make the heart or make your heart or make my heart or you know, f fill in the blank with, with the appropriate thing. Now, the way that Thai people use the term is uh, closer to what you would find in the glossary in, in the back of the book with the idea of to come to terms with something or to reconcile yourself to something. So uh, something regrettable happens and you have to tam jai, you have to accommodate yourself to it. Interestingly though, Kasaniti makes an interesting choice here. Throughout the chapter and later, she continues to, to use the phrase make the heart or make his heart or make her heart rather than saying reconcile himself to to come to terms with uh, to accommodate herself to so this is a curious thing right make the heart is not a phrase that we use in english that it sounds strange to the ear it's uncertain what's going on with that term so why might she do this? Well, I think it's possible that she maintains keep the heart because it sounds odd in English, because it uh, introduces sort of a, a hiccup in our thinking so that we have to pause and think, uh, what's, what's going on? What does this mean? It forces us then to remain open and even feel a little bit uncertain about how Thai people use it. So then we're, by doing this, in a sense, conditioning ourselves uh, not just to assume that it's transparent how they use it, that we can just make this direct translation with to come to terms with, and, and then we've got a handle on it, and, and we don't need to think in, in any kind of subtle way about how Thai people use it. So I don't know that that's what she's doing, but that's my suspicion. So then it's the way that uh, people use the phrase in everyday life that, in, that is of interest to Kasaniti. And so what she might be doing here is simply trying to keep us from making assumptions about how they use it. Here's what she says. Making the heart is a way to talk about the emotional process of coming to terms with something, but it is more than just a feeling. It is an orientation to feelings centered on letting go of affective attachments. So I, I find that very nice. I think she captures very well uh, the particular dynamic that you get with Tam Jai. So that when somebody says Tam Jai, they're not telling you how to feel, they're telling you that you ought to adopt a certain kind of posture towards the feelings that you're having or that you're about to have, right? And that the posture that you have to take is one of not clinging to those feelings, but one of letting those feelings go. We then can already see that there's this kind of kinship between Tam Jai and Jai Yen, in that neither one actually is a feeling. 
so you don't feel the cold heart. Uh, you don't uh, make uh, make the heart is doesn't seem so uh, much like it would be a feeling anyway. But either way, with, in in either case, it's the same point that I'm trying to make that neither one is a feeling. Rather, they are a posture or an orientation one takes toward feelings. So we can also think this in uh, think of this in, in a different way. We can think that of tam jai and jai yen uh, not as nouns but as verbs. That there's something that you do. They imply a certain kind of agency that you act in a certain way, perhaps in a uh, spiritual way uh, or something like that. Uh, rather than it being an actual physical action. So then, these are not things that happen to you, so they're not a noun in that sense, as with feelings, but they are a kind of activity that you undertake. So then rendering tamjai as making the heart may then just be a way of keeping us from thinking too quickly that we know what's going on, that we know what kind of an activity it is, that we know what it is that they're doing. Again, then, this idea that maybe what she's doing is pushing us to maintain a certain level of openness to keep us from feeling too confident that we know just what's going on so that we remain receptive to possibilities other than the ones that we come into this with. But then we can also see that the circumstances in which it comes up are kind of recognizable to us. We, we can see the sorts of things happening in our own lives that happen to the individuals she discusses in the book. Things like losing money, um, like lo dropping, dropping some cash somewhere, uh, getting some bad news. These are things that happen to people everywhere, right? So there's nothing specifically Thai about, about those things. But so then when the uh, doctor, Ma Bom, uh, Ma is doctor, um, when he talking to Dale says, Tam jai di di na, he's saying something like, brace yourself. I'm about to give you some bad bad news, so brace yourself. But that doesn't quite capture it either, right? So that if we were to say that to, to someone, then like you might sort of prepare yourself, you're ready for this news, you're ready to deal with it. Uh, and, and so you are taking a certain kind of posture, a certain kind of attitude toward the news that you're about to get. But we would mean it's something along the lines of uh, you're going to have to be strong in the face of this news. That's not quite the use that Tamjai is doing, has here. Tamjai, rather, is counseling, in the, the case of the doctor, it's the doctor counseling Gao to be prepared to let go of something. So not to confront something, as if in a show of strength, like bracing yourself, but doing the work that you need to do on yourself to prepare yourself to let something go. So we can see there are differences here. They're, they're consequential. A way of considering impermanence then, and the, this idea of letting go rather than, so you can brace yourself as a way of clinging to something Right? You can brace yourself as a way of preparing not to give something up. Say, the, the memory of a loved one uh, who's, who's about to die. Tam Jai, then, is emphasizing this idea of letting go, of being ready to let something go. And it pivots, then, on this notion of impermanence. Or pivots is not the right word. It but it stands in a relationship to impermanence. That if you cling to things rather than letting them go, then you're clinging to things that are in their nature impermanent, and that will bring you suffering. So then to try and get at these notions, 
she turned to this curiosity of building sandcastles during the festival of Songkran, the, the Buddhist New Year. Right, so Songkran is this, uh, it's the water festival where everybody goes out and splashes everybody or um, now everybody has these amazing uh, squirt guns as you can see in the photo here and everybody is fair game so everybody gets soaked and you go out and and spray everybody down it's during the hot season so it's actually a really welcome event in that way and uh and and it's just it's a it's a lot of fun everybody is out having fun soaking and getting soaked um and so after this sort of chaotic day of everybody drenching everybody in sight um they in in the uh, in the story that she's telling, they then go to the river and they start filling up pails with sand to take back to the temple, where they'll build sand castles. So then, there are a whole bunch of um, sort of symbolically important things going on here. The sand castles by their nature, they're sandcastles, so they're impermanent. So you're building something, you're putting this time and energy into creating something that is going in very short order to wither away, to decay into just so much sand on the ground. But it's not just an engagement with this idea of impermanence. It's also, she points out, uh, this kind of ritualistic practice of returning the sand that was on the grounds of the temple that has been tracked out by all of the feet that have passed through the temple grounds over the ensuing year uh, so that the temple grounds maintains its, uh, well, maintains its grounds, frankly, so that this sa sand continues to, uh, doesn't continue. It's not the right way to put it. It's exactly the wrong way to put it. So this sand becomes restored temporarily because, of course, everything is impermanent and the sand will get tracked back out. But it's this way then of uh, recovering to the temple the sand that had made up its ground and has been tracked away and washed away over the ensuing year. So it's not... Uh, it's not fighting back against impermanence, I think, so much as it is an acknowledgement of impermanence and acting in the face of impermanence, but not with the expectation that they're going to establish this permanent sandy base around the temple, but rather that they're simply going to restore it and it will get washed away. Much in the way that a mandala, these, these beautiful um, decorative designs made of colored sand that... Uh, you find in um, more more with Mahayana Buddhists, so um, Northern Buddhists rather than the Theravada Buddhists that you get in Sri Lanka, Thailand, um, uh, Burma, um, where where at least I don't see mandalas appearing. But anyway, so mandalas uh, all the same have this similar kind of uh, quality of constructing something intricate and beautiful that is also made of sand and therefore has impermanence right on the surface of it. That, that impermanence is a constitutive feature of it. So it seems to me like it's the same kind of labor, the same kind of acknowledging and playing with impermanence and preparing yourself for this idea of letting go that the sand castle that you're pouring these hours of labor into designing with care doing communally with the the friends and family around you that you are building something that you necessarily will have to let go of because it it cannot last now Cassanidi uh, presses Gao for this explanation uh, first getting this response, oh, it's just what we do. But then later getting this fuller answer, answer about how the temple grounds gradually lose their sand over the year. And so this, uh, this sort of ritualistic festival atmosphere is a way to replenish it. Um, 
so then we should pause here to consider, does this sound like she is describing this ritual in functionalist terms? She being Cassaniti here, not, not Gail. Does Cassaniti sound like she's employing a kind of functionalist framework to understand what this ritual and what this festival are about? Further, does her search for a meaning in this practice, this practice that is just what they do, does that point to an interpretive approach or a symbolic anthropological approach to understanding what the festival and uh, what the sort of ritualistic construction of the sandcastles is all about? Again, is she doing something akin to Geertz's distinction between a blink and a wink, right? Is she finding something meaningful in what uh, could be mistaken for simply an activity, just um, <clears throat> sort of act acts of the body? Is she seeing acts of the body and then understanding how those acts are meaningful in some symbolic way? engaging in interpretive work, in other words. When she turns to uh, Loi Carton, she here seems more explicit when she discusses the lanterns that the village villagers set aloft. So th there's a way of understanding the, or at least of describing the lanterns as People build lanterns out of very light paper. They have candles underneath them. You light the candle. The heat creates, uh, make, makes the air expand, creates um, um, lift. And so these lanterns <clears throat> drift off into the night sky looking very beautiful. And isn't that lovely? So th there's a way of understanding them and describing them in those terms. That's, that's a very flat way, right? That That is a way of describing it that has no meaning attached to it at all. Cassaniti, on the other hand, draws out what Gail describes. She says of the lanterns, it floats away your thoughts and worries from the year. So then that sounds again an awful lot like interpretive work. The year, not the year. That sounds like the interpretive work of someone like Geertz, who's, fine, who's developing a, a, a thick description of what's going on, where it's not just this kind of mechanical function of light, paper, candle, heat, floating off into the night sky. No, that, that this is meaningful activity, that this is symbolically rich activity. And so what she wants to describe is the symbolic richness of this activity. Um, so the, the same holds for the uh, kratong, the floats that the villagers create to float down the river. Um, so the this is something that I've actually seen. I, I participated in, in this when I was first in Thailand and um, we went to the local temple and we, we built these floats and uh, they're supposed to be sort of the in in the shape of a lotus and uh, you put them on the river and you float them down and uh, the, there will be candles and incense burning on them. Uh, we, the lotus candles and incense are, are sort of three typical uh, materials that you'll find at many sorts of Buddhist events. And, uh, and so off they go and they take your worries with them. Um, now, when I was there, it was interesting uh, because, uh, th so this is just this little temple of no particular renown out in the middle of nowhere. It's a little, it's just a little village temple. And, um, and yet it was the, 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 the hub of social life for the two or three villages around. And um, so you, you did have the floating away of the temples, but you also, as you were constructing these things, had, um, there was a group of, of nuns, bhikkhuni, who showed up and uh, they were passing around these little bowls 
that had rice and some kind of brothy thing and they and the, so they were passing it around everybody was sharing it the expectation was that everyone would enjoy it and then when it it got to me and I got to try some uh this was rice soaked in in rice whiskey and which was not to my taste but um but I thought it was particularly funny that here we were with this very uh, important festival it was joyous it was not a somber festival and that these these nuns were just finding a way of supplementing the joy and the letting go involved in this festival uh nonetheless for uh, the description that Cassanidi gives, the point is that both the lamps, the lanterns rather, and the kratong, the floats, uh, they were both um, embodiments of the same symbolic activity of floating away your troubles, of letting go of your troubles. Now, the interesting thing then is that uh, this, uh, th this woman, Ong, who she's talking to also says, that um, releasing them all together also means that their lives are moving together. So there's this important kind of uh, community or communal quality to, uh, I, I think, probably both the lanterns and the kratong. So again, I would say this raises the, the question of whether we can detect here a particular kind of functionalist or interpretive framework that Kasaniti is implicitly employing. She's not explicit about it, for sure. She's not saying, here I am invoking Geertz. There's none of that. But there may be this kind of implicit employment of these same techniques to provide a thick description or to provide a functionalist description of what it is that uh, festivals are achieving for the community. Moving on then, there are, as Cassanidi says, practices in letting go. But then she also points out that they have meanings and functions beyond the practices of letting go. So then connected to the practices and meanings of letting go are everyday activities of making merit. So um, making merit is something done in the name of Buddhism. It's like a good act, an offering made in the name of Buddhism. And so, so these are companion pieces then. The, the point then I think that she wants to get to is that the practices and meanings are of letting go, which is directly tied to the accumulation of merit, is not something that is restricted to festive days, right? It's not just a ritualized activity for festivals, but that it has a presence in everyday life as well. So then on the whole, making merit comes in some form that supports the temple, the what? Donating money, um, giving, putting food in the alms bowl of the monks in the morning as they make their morning rounds through the village, um, giving them care packages, uh, supporting good causes, making donations for the construction or the maintenance of hospitals and schools and things like that. All of these are the kinds of good acts that gain one merit. <clears throat> but it can also take the form of strictly symbolic acts so that it's not, um, it's not strictly utilitarian then in its conception. It, so the donation to the school gains merit not because the outcome is that the school does better. It's not the utility of what you do, but rather it's the symbolic act that you undertake and the spirit with which you make it. So that if you uh, engage in this thing uh, that you, you see in the photo here, you give money to somebody who has birds in a cage. That person releases the birds. The birds fly free. And the important thing in terms of making merit is that you've done it with the spirit of freeing these birds. It doesn't matter that the birds are all trained to fly back 
and to return to the cage so that somebody else five minutes later can come and pay his or her money and the birds get released and they make the same, uh, the, the, run the same lap around and then wind up back in the cage. Uh, this is something that's pretty widespread and, and you can see it in big markets everywhere. It, it's, it, it, it's a regular practice. So that again, the point is that you're doing this with a particular kind of spirit. And so they point out that similarly, if you make a donation to a temple, but that you do it when you're in an angry mood or you do it resentfully, that that is not going to gain you merit. So that again, even though your donation will have a certain utility in maintaining the temple or maintaining the school or what have you, that if you do it in the wrong spirit, then there's no uh, karmic bounty waiting for you at the end of what you what you at the end of your act, because you're possessed of the wrong spirit as you do it. Now Cassinetti then goes on to explain that uh, there are practices of letting go, but uh, oh, wrong way. Okay. Uh, so given the importance of merit making then, right? Merit making is uh, a pervasive and important activity in every Thai Buddhist's life. So then given the importance of making merit, um, Cassinetti then asks if there is a gendered aspect to it, to the exercise of power generally in Mejeng. So part of the reason that this question comes up is that there is no tradition currently in Thailand, and in fact, there is resistance to it in the monkhood, the Sangha, uh, to the ordination of women as, as monks. Uh, and so this is, this is part of what is spurring her interest in this, right? Because again, she, her interest is in the everyday life of Buddhism. If only boys can become monks, that's an important feature of everyday practices of Buddhism. So then she wants to know, is tamjai, this idea of making the heart, of reconciling yourself and letting go, uh, is that a feminist issue, she asks. It seems then at first blush that it may be that women must exercise more forbearance than men. They carry more of the burden of maintaining the household and businesses that they're the ones who are put in the position of having to engage in tamjai. They're asked uh, and expected more persistently to be the ones to reconcile themselves to the dif difficult situations that life gives them. She goes on to suggest, though, that the convergence of matrilineal kinship matrilocality, so matrilineal kinship, tracing lineage through the, the mother, uh, matrilocality, meaning that when the family, when, when uh, a couple weds, that they move to the village, sometimes the household of the, uh, the bride, not the groom. So the groom does the moving, in other words. Matril matrilineality, matrilocality, and economic responsibility that these three things um, actually converge to put woman, women in charge in important ways. Even if that means that they have more labor to do on their part. And so she, she gets a number of, um, of interviewees and of friends talking about this. And they, and they say, oh yeah, like women, women run Mejeng. They, they're the ones who are in positions of responsibility, in positions of power. They're the ones who make things happen. Even, even uh, festivities that occur at the temple that is supposed to be this preserve of maleness because it's all male monks, they even run those things, right? So that in this village, women are in charge. This is, this is the idea that she hears uh, over and over again. And, and that is part of the explanation for the relative idleness of men in the village, that they just don't have as much to do because they don't have 
any meaningful power, they're not in charge of anything, and so they also have fewer responsibilities and are just left less active in businesses, less active in maintaining the household, and so forth. Now, pursuing this, this insight with re reference to her central interests, she learns that behaviors but not feelings are gendered. So that when people talk about feelings, it's not like women feel some things and men feel other things and there are some things that are felt exclusively by one and not the other. Behaviors, though, she says, are. So that uh, she cites this example of, of a woman who is hauling a, a propane gas tank into her place. Uh, her husband is... I can't remember why he's absent, but he, he, he's absent. Uh, he may have simply left. Um, and so she jokes that now she has to be the man and the woman of the house. She has, she has to be the husband and the wife in this case, because she's doing this heavy labor of hauling the gas tank in. So then she says, yeah, there, there are some behaviors that are recognized to be male behaviors, others that are recognized to be female behaviors, but these are behaviors, not feelings. And so this leads to certain kinds of curiosities in turn. Women are the ones to uphold morality, and yet they can't become monks. So then the single uh, most important path to gaining merit, becoming a monk, is closed off to them. They can't do it in that way. So there's this almost paradox where they are uh, denied the most straightforward, most meritorious route to upholding morality, and yet they're also held up as sort of the bastions of morality. Further, women are leaders in the community, but therefore they're also expected to work harder. In the end, then, what she finds is that on the whole, women don't lead emotionally disadvantaged lives in Mejang. So then a more relevant as uh, aspect of social life on the emotional plane is this notion of rengjai. It's this kind of deferential attitude that is this crucial element in all hierarch hierarchical social interactions. And that's pretty much every social interaction that you're going to find. So then social interaction is um, pretty much always stratified. There's always going to be a superior and a subordinate. And that can play out according to all sorts of different criteria. Age is a crucial one, of course. Um, but uh, a monk who uh, may be just a, 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 a teenage boy uh, will, by virtue of being monk, a monk, have status that elevates him above people who are not monks, but, but yet they're older. And so... Uh, so there are all kinds of different factors. Uh, a position, like an, an official position, uh, if you're a teacher, that gives you a certain kind of status that will counterbalance um, age if somebody is older than you. Um, all of these different sorts of things will factor into status and relative status so that in every social interaction, you you have to uh, weigh these things to figure out who in this scenario is the superior, who is the subordinate, and it's and it's very very important then to maintain social harmony to be observant of these things, and so grengjai, the, this kind of uh, slightly anxious deference is an important aspect of how you behave as a subordinate in a social interaction. And equally, uh, as, as she points out, that if you're having somebody over to your house, then you can tell them like, oh, don't be grangjai, don't, like, don't, don't, don't be deferential, make yourself comfortable here. Uh, not 
not that that has the effect of making people less rengjai, less deferential, less anxious in your place, uh, but it's a, it's a gesture along the lines of saying mikasa sukasa, something like that. Uh, and um, so that, anyway, so that th this is a, an important constitutive part of social interaction and that subordinates are supposed to embody grengjai uh, in their social interactions. So then it's not like deference in the sense of deferring to someone's expertise. So then if, um, if I have something wrong with my car, I don't have a car, but pretend for the purposes of the example. Something's wrong with my car, um, and I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on. I lack, I lack the knowledge, so I take it to the mechanic. The mechanic is going to give me some advice on, on what to do, on how I should handle the situation, and I will defer to the expertise of the mechanic because the mechanic actually has the relevant knowledge to give me advice, so I'll defer to that. But in that situation... That's just deferring to expertise. There's none of this sort of undertone of anxiety in that situation. So Grengjai doesn't capture that. It captures this notion of deference to somebody's authority as a function of his or her position, superior position, in a hierarchy. And so the anxiety is in part about showing the proper de proper deference so that there's no conflict, so that there's this nice, smooth social in interaction. But it's also, in a sense, uh, an expression of anxiety that um, this is a person who, who can help my life or can hinder my life depending on how I behave, if I behave properly or not. And so it's important to show the proper deference, partly as a matter of just social nicety and partly as a matter of how to uh, make sure that I can get along in society. The, her point then is that the expectation to let go emotionally to Tam Jai is only sometimes a gendered expectation. Right? That sometimes there will be a gendered aspect to that, but not always. But it is always located within hierarchical relations. So that if you had to work out which was the more important with respect to letting go, gender or hierarchy, that here hierarchy is going to be the more important factor in social life. Inhabiting a subordinate hierarchical position imposes grengjai on you. And that means that your opportunities for letting go are more limited. Or, if you have a superior position, more enabled, depending on your social status. Affect, she concludes then, is socially constructed. So this is a provocative claim. She doesn't sell it as this particularly provocative claim, like, oh, look at me being provocative. She's more subtle than that. But it is a provocative claim to say that affect is socially constructed. Why, why would that be? Okay, so the Oxford English Dictionary, under the subheading for affect, that is the psychology subheading, says that affect is a feeling or subjective experience accompanying a thought or action or occurring in response to a stimulus, an emotion, a mood. In later use, so that would probably be contemporary use, usually as a mass now, the outward display of emotion or mood as manifested by facial expression, posture, gestures, tone of voice, etc. Now, the crucial thing here is that within psychology, according to the OED anyway, affect is a subjective experience. And yet here she is saying, not that it's subjective, but saying that it is social in nature. It is interpersonal in nature. 
And so th this is why the claim that she's making here is an interesting and provocative claim. It, it cuts against the grain of expectations that affect is subjective. She's challenging the idea then that it's simply subjective, making the case that, as Greng Jai suggests, affect is an interpersonal construction, right? That, that the affect that you have or that you adopt has to do with the, uh, the social interaction in which you're engaged. This is evident uh, in morning rituals, for example. So um, say a loved one has died and you're experiencing grief over that individual's death. The morning ritual, though, is not simply going to be the subjective expression of your, your grief, but rather, in the cases she's looking at in, in Thailand, the morning ritual is there to help detach emotional feelings, thereby letting the attachment one has to the loved one go. You're letting go of your attachment to the loved one, which seems, again, that seems like a counterintuitive approach to take to your feelings for someone you love. Letting, letting that love go, that seems counterintuitive. But, she says, this is what the morning ritual is designed to do in Thailand. Next chapter, holding on. So then the, um, the switch from letting go to holding on is partly enabled by this, um, the, this figuring of death and mourning. Um, because if the mourning ritual is supposed to be about letting go so that um, you're not attached to your feelings for this person, you're not attached to the person after he or she has died, uh, the figure of Sen and his inability to let go of his grandmother who has recently died is that sort of the pivot point between the two chapters. Okay, so now holding on. Here we have the contrast between the two from one chapter to the next. Gail's brother Sen then is the case in point. He's, he's like the... Um, uh, the the counterexample that is supposed to kind of prove the rule. Why? Because he does everything in this kind of non-conventional, non-Thai way. He's unable to relinquish his attachment to his deceased grandmother. He he doesn't go to the funeral for one thing. He doesn't engage in mourning. And you, and you can see throughout the chapter that uh, his continued and uh, growing consumption of Lao, of, of rice whiskey, uh, as the chapter progresses, consuming it in greater and greater quantities and doing less and less with his days, is directly connected to his refusal to mourn for his grandmother and his refusal to let her go, his continued attachment to his grandmother um, has a lot to do with how it is that he just winds up in his room day after day, uh, maintaining uh, a state of sort of, well, at least trying to maintain a, a state of alcohol-induced numbness. But there's more than that going on here. His drinking relies uh, relates on one side to his lack of conviction in Buddhism. And so his... Uh, refusal to mourn and to let go is connected to his absence from uh, the, the temple and religious events, his lack of um, his lack of persuasion that Jayen and Tam Jai are useful ways to conduct his life. On the other side, then, there is the issue of his homosexuality, which it's this thing that everybody recognizes, but nobody, including Sen, acknowledges. In part, it creates a problem for him uh, because he's, he's the older brother, 
and so he's in his 30s and and by by his 30s typically a son has moved out of the um the house of his parents and and is living with um stereotypically with his his wife and raising the family and and doing all those proper things right but there he is he's still in the family home um Gail has married and her husband lives now with them because remember matro locality and um and and there's friction between Sen and his brother-in-law because uh the brother-in-law um seems to have this feeling that uh what what is Sen doing here all he does is he hangs around he drinks all day he sort of languishes in his room he doesn't help he doesn't contribute any, anything to the family. He can't help out in the family shop. Uh, he's kind of this dead weight. And why is he here anyway? He's an adult. He should be married and and off uh, with in his wife's village. Sen, on uh, on his side, resents his brother-in-law, who has, in in his view, taken away his sister's affections and taken away her attention from him. And, uh, and, and so again, you know, he's attached to these things and he is not engaging in Tamjai to let them go. He's remaining attached to them. So then Sen recognized, but didn't really put stock in, in these highly culturally valued practices of Jai Yen and Tamjai. And there were a couple of results from this. First, it made his social interactions awkward and distant. She, she writes, in an environment where the emotional tone of words and actions is important and keeping others' interests in mind is valued, Sen often found himself saying nothing at all rather than breaching social norms. So it's not like he's unaware of the social norms and just steamrolls over them. He's aware of them, but he doesn't value them. And... Uh, and yet he doesn't want to provoke uh, discontent with the people around him. And so a lot of the time he's he's just sort of withdrawing into himself through all of this because it's easier for him to say nothing at all rather than to breach social norms. Second, it left him in this kind of half disconnected way socially. Um, so along with his disinclination to let go, he found himself isolated and this was painful, right? One of the things that he wanted to hang on, he wanted to hang on to his grandmother. He wanted to hang on to his sister's, uh, attention and affection. And he was having trouble letting go of these things and, so he was finding himself increasingly isolated, missing the very things that he, that he wanted to have. It's tempting then to try and diagnose him psychologically. But Kassaniti opts for something different, for a social and a Buddhist diagnosis. She notes that in a community that is very attentive to the hazards of attachment uh, in an ephemeral world, hence the emphasis they place on Tamjai. Sen's attachment expressed as a desire for permanence, his longing for the village that he grew up in, not the village that has changed into the village that it is now, leads to his suffering, and it also puts him out of step with his community. Right. So if, if we were to think back to what Geertz has to say about the work of the anthropologist being to find his feet or find her feet with the people with whom he wants to or she wants to study. There's something comparable going on here that there's a way that Sen can't find his feet or keep his feet with the people around him. Detachment then is the ideal. But people recognize that it's not really achievable. They value it and they strive for it, they pursue it, they engage 
in the practices that they engage in as a piece as a as a way to re reduce suffering but they recognize that they can't a attain the kind of detachment that would also lead to the cessation of all suffering that that in fact that would be nirvana wouldn't it the the release from suffering Kasanidi again compares Mejeng and Ban Kotao. She notes that the people in Ban Kotao uh, engaged in more expressive discussion than in Mejeng, reflecting different approaches to mental health. In particular, in Ban Kotao, neither Jai Yen nor Tam Jai were really prevalent social practices. Uh, again, this idea that they were much more expressive, that when they lost something valuable or when something was stolen from them, they would get upset about that, and they would feel like that was the appropriate response. That's quite different from what you get in Mejeng. So then impermanence, similarly, was not as prevalent uh, or as important a concept within this Christian community. Also not surprising, when, when you're attached to an idea of a permanent soul that will outlive your body and uh, have everlasting life in heaven, the idea of an impermanence just can't have the same kind of traction. In the end, she concludes that only some aspects of emotional religious life in Mejeng are less relevant to everyday experience in Ban Kotal. So that they they have, they're, they're sort of in a way on a continuum with one another. So that it's not that um, there's a complete absence of the principles in Ma Jeng from Ban Kotal, but, but that the weight that they have in one or the other place is quite different. So then this, she thinks, points to the cultural specificity of emotion and change in the Buddhist community. The difficulty that Sen faced was that he was living in Mejeng, right? So that he was inscribed within rather than apart from the larger cultural orientations of his community and his problems were understood within them, so that the sorts of suffering that he experienced because of his attachment, for example, were, this is the point she's been trying to emphasize, social in nature. It's because of the particular social context in which he found himself. So then where the Christians in Ban Gotao said that they would pray for Sen, the Buddhists in Mejeng responded to his situation by holding uh, Buddha amulets. There, there'd be these little amulets of the Buddha in, in a variety of different poses that have different meanings. Uh, so they would have these amulets and they would hold them in their hands as they would why toward him. The idea being that they could communicate the power of the Buddha to Sen and in, in doing that, uh, help him heal, help, help him achieve a state of detachment. In either case, either the praying or the uh, projection of, of the power of the Buddha through the amulet, the communities were kind of at a loss how to address socially the problem of one who is socially out of step with his community. So that they had practices to try and address this. But what Cassanidi is pointing to is that in an important way, the problems besetting Sen are social in nature. They're socially construction, constructed. Uh, and so not simply psychological problems, not problems of him as an isolated individual. And so his social isolation requires a different kind of approach than the prayers and 
the using the use of the Buddha amulets to address him. They can identify that he's stuck in the past, that this is a problem, right? Being stuck in the past is a problem. But in a community that's socially, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally organized around notions of impermanence and attachment, they have few resources to help him. So this is, this is the point that we reach uh, at the end of the, the, um, the, the second section now. Uh, this moment of Sen being kind of dislocated from his community, which is not this dislocated, is not the same as being distanced from, but sort of trying to continue to live in a community whose principles he doesn't accept and whose uh, pain, in a way, is therefore unresolvable within that community because his pain in important ways is a social product. Uh, so this brings us, anyway, to the, to the end of the section. We have one more section to go then, and we will get to that next week.